Ty Greg Perry, the historic preservationist, uh, we're going to have a, 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 a brief uh, dissertation here. I had a lot of requests to uh, explain how the oldest tavern in the state of New Jersey came to be, the oldest colonial tavern. Um, so we're going we're to go back to the very, very beginning. Um, we're going to explain a little bit about colonial life in the tavern and uh, also how it ended up mating up with another dwelling in Woodstown, New Jersey. So, so let's go way back. <clears throat> let's go back over 350 years. Um, somewhere around 1650, uh, Charles II, King Charles II, uh, was reaffirmed, and uh, one of his one of his first tasks of expanding the British Empire, uh, particularly in the West into America, which we call the colonies, uh, was to grab some land. So he uh, he was sending uh, ambassadors let's call them ambassadors, over to America, which would become America, to uh, be salesmen, to sell land, or real estate type agents. <clears throat> so Charles would have his eyes on uh, various people around the British Empire to send them to various places he wanted. And to, as far as we're sitting here in southern New Jersey, and we're talking about the, uh, the sign of the Key Tavern, which is located in Woodstown, New Jersey, New Jersey's oldest tavern, Charles had his eye on a John Shivers, and John Shivers, at the age of 19, was an administrator at Monkstown, Monkstown Castle, and uh, Monkstown Castle was a monastery in, uh, in Ireland. So it was a huge monastery, and almost encompassing about a thousand individuals. But John Shivers, young John Shivers, he's, he's running the books, basically, but he had a, a good... Uh, good relationship with the king and uh, he, the king told him or asked him and probably actually told him that he wanted him to go to over to the colonies to West Jersey and that's where southern New Jersey is today and that's what it was called West Jersey and to uh, to sell land to try and populate so he sent John Shivers over across the ocean just about 1660 um, the objective here was to start in southern New Jersey, which was West Jersey, and move up the Delaware, uh, the Delaware coastline of the Delaware River, Delaware Bay, and then up the Delaware River, and to eventually end up around Burlington or Old Burlington City as we know it today, which is still a very historic town. Um, so, <clears throat> so John Shivers was sent over by ship. He comes with about 20 Englishmen. Um, basically, they're individuals who are good at setting up camps and building houses and cutting down trees and delegating and things like this, this type of thing. So the first objective um, was to find a port. So going up the southern New Jersey coastline from Cape May up toward Philadelphia, the largest river is the Salem City River. Um, we call it the Salem River at that point. It wasn't there, there was no Salem City. Um, but they found this river and it would later become in around 1675 um, by the help of one John Fenwick, a Quaker who came over from England uh, to settle and create this hamlet of Salem City. But nevertheless, John Shivers comes over with his entourage and they start building a port on Salem River. Uh, a port was wharves, a warehouse, walkways. They brought provisions, uh, you know, rope and axes and to the proper tooling they needed. Uh, this, believe it or not, because it was so heavily wooded, even though we're sitting on the banks of the river, took about two years to complete. And part of the mission was a delegation <coughs> led by John Chivers was to um, get in the good graces of the Native Americans, particularly the Lenni Lenape Indians, which were located throughout West Jersey, to get on the good side, to barter with them, to make peace with them, to make friends. And by bartering with them, they were able to get a lot of work done. Um, aided and bedded them in, in getting you know, food supplies and basically their survival in general. So remember, they came over in two different sailing vessels, um, and landed and then started building the port. 
and their vessels were around 35 to maybe 45 feet long, uh, landing at the, uh, the what was now the Salem River, Salem Creek as some call it. That took two years, so let's bring us up to about 1662. The next objective, and I must say that for a horse in the 18th century, the 17th century, horses were viable for whether they're pulling and they have a passenger on top or pulling a cart or wagon, viable for around eight miles. So then it made sense that every eight miles there needed to be a quote tavern or a public house placed. And at that point, an individual could spend the night or trade his horse in and continue on to the next tavern for eight miles. So the first objective from the Port of Salem was to cut a swath from that port eight miles up, straight north. So where did they land? They landed where today Route 40 and Route 45 in Woodstown, New Jersey. And kind of the interesting thing is when 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 I've done this talk many times, we we kind of joke that um, there's a Wawa and then there's a bar there, the corner bar. So this first tavern was to be landed where the corner bar is. So, but for the next five years, um, the Englishmen and bartering with Native Americans, the objective was to cut a trek about eight feet wide, eight miles long from the Port of Salem to route, where Route 45 and 40's intersection is today. So that took those years, brutal. Um, there were so many trees, so much canopy cover, so many trunks, and this is old growth forest that a squirrel could go from Maine to Florida, and this is reminiscent of the type of forest it was, and never touch the ground sitting on the canopies. So once they reached that intersection, or where that intersection would later become, they needed to create a sawmill. So they went to what is now Woodstown Lake, um, which uh, is, a, is a relatively small, it's only about a quarter mile by a mile long at that point. But there was a, uh, a natural spillway there, so they dammed it up, they built a sawmill, and uh, that's where all the timber was milled for this, uh, for this first tavern or public house uh, going north through West Jersey. Uh, a lot of oak, white oak was, was found here, poplar, pine, um, some of the pine boards that could be had could be in the 24 to 36 inch wide, believe it or not, 36 inch wide down the center of the trunk. Um, the white oak, uh, there was multiple stands of this. And remember, we want to use this for its rot resistance in building and uh, constructing timber frame structures. So it took another, it took another year to, to do the, to the damming the, the spillway, build the mill, and then they started to build the tavern. So the mill, uh, and the spillway was only about a uh, half a mile. So the drag of the lumber up was relatively close. And there was actually a staging ground about 600 feet away where they cleared out. And they would actually build the sides and uh, the roof structures and things like that of the tavern. And they had two experts, a timber framer that came in with John Shivers. And they would preform these and then take them apart and number them and with two oxen and wood sleds and dragged it up to where it was sitting at Route 40 and 45. So around the middle of 1669 in June, the tavern was totally built. It was two and a half stories, two bays wide. Um, it contained no windows on all three sides. It contained three windows in the front, two in the top, one at the bottom with a door when facing the tavern on the left side. And it was uh, <clears throat> a door of somewhat uh, Dutch and uh, British origin. It had a, uh, a diamond pattern in the middle, very heavy duty, very clad, because remember there were friendly Indians and non-friendly Indians, Native Americans then. And even uh, travelers, who knows what to expect from who. And when this tavern was built, there was virtually no other dwellings, traditionally made dwellings, probably within 35 to 45 miles away, all the way up to Philadelphia. Um, so this was, this was pioneering effort, this was breaking through. 
there were people living in huts and things like that. Some some natives, some uh, you know, native uh, Brits that have come over, and I often find it interesting. Just imagine if you're uh, you were born in, in the, the wild here, surviving, and and all of a sudden you see this wonderful structure go up, and this would become a meeting place, and you've never walked into a room, let alone a building before, and you can meet other people and see other people, that. It's, it's an experience you never had. Um, so maybe kind of like going into a bar at, at today, but obviously we've seen other people, but this was uh, uh, for the first time. So, so the bar was built. Um, it had cedar on the outside, cedar siding, and uh, it was a timber frame structure and it had cedar shaped roofs. So it was comprised downstairs of two rooms a hearth room, when you walk in the front door, you had a, a massive harvest type table and you would have had someone tending it. It could have been a Native American, it could have been a woman, um, and it could have been some, some, uh, some sort of slave we had at that point. And in that room to the right was built a large hearth and the hearth was made for cooking. And as you walk straight through to the second room, it was the cage bar room. And the cage bar room was a place where alcohol was had and uh, it would be tend to be locked up at the end of the day because alcohol was the most sacred commodity. People uh, desperately would have stolen, killed for alcohol because we have to remember a couple other things that the water system um, was plagued with parasites and bacteria and not even babies could drink it. So everyone was drinking a type of ale, a local made ale or hard cider. So John Shivers, in June of 1669, opens this tavern. Um, this tavern is a stop-off point. So the intention, let's talk about the intention of the crown. The crown is to ship people over from England. And uh, they, they would probably promote it in England, saying, go to America, buy plots of land, you know, the, the broad expanse of freedom. And uh, people would have bought into a, uh, a ship coming over and you could have had 30, 40, 50 people coming over. They bought into the ship, uh, the ship voyage. And once they got here, then they would go to the first, to this meeting house or to this tavern uh, to buy land if they wanted to, or they could go further up north to the next tavern stop and the next tavern stop. So, so that's how it was intended to be almost a real estate stop. So John Shivers was selling real estate here. It was actually a fur trading center because the people who came over if they weren't accustomed to some of the hard winters we were having here on the east coast of the colonies, they would be trading and bartering for furs um, or just spending the night and moving on. And back in uh, the port of Salem, which was we're gonna call the Royal Port, um, you could have purchased a horse immediately off the boat. So they were um, paying Native Americans to, to, uh, grow, to round up and to, uh, to breed horses be sold to the newcomers coming over. So what, what do they do in a tavern? So other than having food, um, you could spend the night in the tavern. There were two rooms upstairs. And for one pence, you could get the fare of the day, which could, was only one item which was being cooked. It could be rabbit, it could be uh, venison, um, and you would have had an ale or a hard cider and that was it. So for one pence, you would get that meal, go to the tavern side, sit and enjoy it, and you could spend the night upstairs. In the, uh, the luxury room, let's call it over the fireplace upstairs, the one pence room, um, you could sleep on a corn husk mattress and it would hold up to 12 other people. So you can make some new friends that night. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people that have been on the road, on the boat, on the horse, that smell absolutely lovely, probably not cleaning themselves for many, many months sometimes. Uh, or you could, for a half a pence, you could stay in the other room and sleep on the floor with a burlap blanket. So, and the capacity upstairs was about 24 individuals. And in the dining room, which, which sort of two tavern tables where the cage bar is, you could hold about 12 patrons. So <clears throat> I'm the curator of uh, the, the tavern. Um, I found out about the tavern. I knew nothing about it. How I got involved with the tavern is purchasing a house at 68 North Main Street in historic Woodstown. 
And I had uh, a family of the shivers came forth about a year and a half later with 12 diaries and a whole series of invoices and inventories going back to 1669. That told me what exactly was in that tavern on opening day. How many people stayed there? How many people came by? Only three. What the weather was like on that day. So it was a lot of great information. I, I couldn't believe it because purchasing the house, I didn't realize that the South Third, the house is in thirds, and we'll later get to a, uh, a photograph of the house. The South Side is the tavern. The middle part of the house is the original townhouse built by John Shiver's son, Samuel Shiver's. And the third part of the house was dated 1813. It was passed on to the Shin family by marriage in the 1770s. So, uh, just not to get too confusing here, it's a lot of information, but to push forward, the tavern um, actually ran by John Shivers, and Samuel Shivers, the son, was the pr procurer. He was involved in buying dry goods and cloth and rope and, and various toolings and things like that from France. So France, England, Germany, and Italy. So he was a, he was a businessman, and uh, if we push a little bit ahead, when John Shivers passes away in the uh, early 1720s, Samuel Shivers doesn't want to have any part of being uh, running the tavern life. He grew up around it. And as he became a procurer of these uh, dry goods, he built, a, he built the house at 68 North Main, the center portion of the Shivers house. And when, by the time his dad passed away, he had two daughters. So when his dad passed away, he felt that um, he weighed the cost of building a dwelling, or what does he want to do with the tavern that now his dad has, has passed away? So he's going to sell the tavern. So he sells the tavern, the land of the tavern, keeps the tavern, and he gets two Native Americans and three oxen and a wood sled. The Native Americans disassemble the tavern, label it, and they put the pieces on the wood sled and the oxen drive it 1.8 miles up, which is, would be Route 40, and then up, make a left on Route 45 to 68 North Main Street, and reassemble the tavern onto his, quote, townhouse, which was not very big in the day. It was 24 feet wide, again, two stories, two bays, and they, the tavern was basically the same dimensions. So they reassemble the tavern to the south side of his house, and it becomes part of his house. So his house doubles in size, probably for the amount of a mere 24 US dollars back then. So it was absolutely for nothing, and it was about trading for the Indians or bartering with the uh, Indians or the Native Americans. Um, it could have been tools and food and other things. So Samuel Shivers comes way on top, he sells the land, he sells the wood mill, and he ends up disassembling the tavern. So it's a huge change in his life. But he still continues, he still continues to um, import dry goods. He uses the, what would, would have been the front room of the tavern as it was attached to the Shivers house as a dry goods center. But when they assembled the house to the Shivers house museum, the back of the tavern came to the front of the house and they added four windows there. These windows were added uh, to balance the house out architecturally. And these windows had eight over eight panes. So eight over eight lights, okay, and all handmade muttons and mullions. So when I purchased the, the dwelling, all of this hidden secrets were locked away in the clapboard where the two dwellings met. Uh, on the inside, the, uh, an owner used sheetrock to cover over all the plaster. So we have to keep in mind that the Shivers house, the entirety of it, uh, including the 1813 section, uh, went up until 1946 without any electricity, any plumbing, or any heating. So anyone who lived in the house would have used a wood or a coal stove, they would have used candles, and they would have used quote, outhouse or chamber pots. And up until 1920, the, uh, all the cooking was done in a summer kitchen, which was located approximately 40 feet behind the house. 
It was a brick structure. And we found with a few basic, basic, very basic, hand architectural digs, bricks and other things back there, noting the circumference of the foundation. Um, so in the future, there may be some kind of digs in the back, we don't know. So the 1920, a, a lean-to kitchen was added off, a two-story lean-to kitchen was added off the back of the house. And so that makes the Shivers house very interesting that it's four centuries of build, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 21st century. So four centuries of build. Um, so let's talk about in 1946, what happened? We have a, an individual purchased the house, um, a Betty Lippincott that wants to open an antique shop. So she tends to gut the entire tavern area. She takes the cage bar out, all the wagon wheel type wainscoting and, and a couple other rooms. There was a music room on the 1813 side. She takes the original front door and a plethora of other uh, amounts of millwork and sells them to a woman in Maine. So I'm moving along with my restoration, and this is all simultaneous that I get a call from someone in Maine and said that his mother had purchased um, these millwright type items in 1946 with the hopes of putting, her, putting them up in her house in Maine, kind of decorating it out. The, the mother dies, this man I'm talking to, the son, uh, inherits this, uh, this woodwork, this millwork, and he had the same kind of uh, possibility of buying an old house and, or do, taking his mother's house and putting the millwork in it. But he's calling me, telling me he has a few months to live, he's got cancer, and would I be interested in buying them? He understands I am a historic preservationist and would I come and purchase them? So for about $2,000, I FedExed a check out to him and uh, told him I'd see him in about a week and rented a truck and went up and brought the millwork back. So I brought back the cage bar, uh, wainscoting, rains, uh, waste, raised paddle work for many of the rooms, a lot of various moldings, and it all came back. Simultaneously with the, uh, the 12 shippers' diaries and inventories and invoices from the tavern originally, and doing the restoration, taking off the clavern on the outside, I discovered the, uh, the drive-up window, and it's been certified as the oldest drive-up window in the state of New Jersey. So obviously it's the oldest, the oldest tavern, 1669. The window was intact. Um, I had to restructure the clapboard, the old clapboard around the window, uh, pulled the sheetrock off from the inside, and the window ends up in the cage bar. Uh, the height elevation is a little bit different now because the uh, Shivers house is about two to two and a half feet, around about 30 inches higher than the original tavern would have been. So then that makes the possibility of riding up on your horse uh, just a little bit, a little bit of a stretch to get to that window. But because the, uh, the main part of the house was already there, then the tavern had to level off on the elevation of that. So that's what we have. So pushing forward, um, having the, this indisposable piece of information, these, uh, these diaries, I know exactly what was in the tavern, as I said prior, uh, what was in the tavern as far as furniture goes, accoutrements, uh, cooking utensils, everything uh, abounds on the day of opening day. So what I've done is I've tried to go to auction to purchase uh, all uh, type of cast iron pots and anything involved with cooking. The crane is original, the bricks in the diary, the, uh, the hearth fireplace was taken apart, all the bricks were labeled, and they were reassembled as they were back then. Um, so, Today, the tavern stands as it would have been decorated to the best of my ability, being the curator, uh, right down to the various plates and, and uh, pewter mugs I'm using, the origins. There's also a bench in there from uh, Bath, England. And uh, we know that uh, John Shivers uh, actually had sent over a, a pewter or a, a large wooden bench, an oak bench, and it was from the, uh, the cathedral in Bath. So it comes over and that's actually carved in. But you know, a lot of hunting, it takes, it takes a, a plethora of time to hunt down these various auctions to find the accoutrements and the furniture. So, so to fast forward, so what we're trying to do is to um, bring community awareness uh, 
to the local community and to give them a, to give them a reason to build around uh, the museum. And we're going to fast forward now to about 1813 when the northern side of the house, so now the house, as we look at the Shivers House Museum on the outside, it's broken down into three components. So the, the, the 1813 section, uh, they added a music room on the downside and, uh, and a dining room. And on the top section is two bedrooms. So that's where we go. 